Hey everyone. Uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, the food should be here shortly. We got some folks handling that now. Uh, we'll get kicked off and then as the food arrives, we'll, uh, we'll take a break, get food, and then we'll jump back into it. Sound good? Okay. Um, so welcome, welcome to my TED talk. Uh, my name is uh, Randy Pitcher. I am a data engineer with HashMap. Uh, we're a systems integrator. We work closely, closely with Snowflake, uh, speciality, specializing in like data applications. Um, and I mean, just by a show of hands, who here uses Snowflake today? Wow, almost everyone. Okay, a lot of people, cool. Um, and then who here uh, thinks they'll be using it in 2020 at their job? Oh yeah, okay, so the people using it and then, okay, cool. Um, so if this is your first one here, uh, we, we do these monthly. Uh, we try to have a, a useful topic or uh, sometimes multiple topics to make it interesting to people who are technical and also maybe a little less technical. So if you have any questions, we keep it pretty conversational. Um, we are recording, so I don't, I don't know, don't like give me your credit card number or anything. Um, and yeah, if you have questions, just jump in. So, you know, what are we gonna talk about today? Cause this could mean anything. I intentionally made it kind of vague. Um, really specifically, I, I'm gonna do a brief introduction to CI. Like I, I'm not interested in like giving a, um, a 101 course, but I'm gonna maybe contextualize what I mean when I say CI in, in the context of this uh, discussion. Um, then we're going to talk about doing automation with GitHub Actions. Uh, and then we're going to go into the data build tool, DBT, uh, which is actually secretly what this talk has always been about. Um, but, you know, people don't buy DBT, they buy automation. So uh, I decided to brand it a little differently. Uh, then we're going to get hands-on, super hands-on. I'm going to write code live, stuff I don't know if it works or not yet, which is not a good idea. Um, but I think we'll, we'll learn from it either way. Um, we're gonna dive into a rolling sum of Snowflake credit usage. This is a, a, a key metric that I use to understand if our usage is going up or down on our Snowflake account. Um, more than just looking at like total in a billing period or something, I wanna see how it goes over a, a window. Um, then we'll jump into how you can do some testing for your CI flows. Uh, then we'll show adding a new requirement with DBT and how easy that uh, can be. Then I've got some bonus. Uh, then we'll go into questions. Any questions so far? Cool, good. Um, let's get in. So continuous integration, what do I talk about? What do I mean when I say that? So continuous integration to me is the process of not having to manually deploy your code once it's in version control. Um, dev, I think we're on our laptops, we're writing code, we're seeing if it works manually, great. And if it does, we make a PR. Uh, for a new feature, and then we have someone code review it, and hopefully it passes some kind of test suite. And locally we might have some of our unit tests, but ideally before it gets merged into any sort of master or release branch, um, we're doing integration tests. With pure database SQL based uh, flows, that's not always super simple to do. Um, you might have your own processes, use Python with test suites and then have assertions for different SQL files. Uh, or you might have an error table that if it has any data in it at the end of your integration tests, like you know that tells you about an error or a failure. Um, but today we're gonna talk about some other approaches for that. So first you take your code, you get it committed um, into your, your version control system. Today we're using Git and GitHub. Um, then your CI pipeline is going to build everything, test it in something that approximates your production environment. And then upon review with uh, all your checks passed, your tests uh, don't fail, and someone else on your team has reviewed your code, um, it's gonna get accepted and then automatically deployed to production. That way we're uh, incrementally and continuously delivering new features and not having to worry about massive changes or delivering behemoths that can delay your project life cycle quite a bit. Uh, and, and specifically for a lot of my clients and kind of the way I think about this, we have three major environments. Dev, um, like we talked about, that's when you're developing on a branch. Um, you for sure do not want to be hitting production here because you're going to be breaking things, sometimes on purpose, uh, and, and just seeing what works. Next we have test, um, which you can argue should live in dev, some people do. I, I like it to be its own isolated environment. And this is where my automation tools on their own are gonna execute my tests and um, run some integration testing as well to make sure, as well as we can tell, going to production will not break things. 
Uh, great. And then prod, that's where when something finally hits master, after a PR has been accepted, uh, our, our code will be deployed in production ready to be used. We'll run some amount of testing to ensure like there isn't something weird between the test and the prod environment. Snowflake makes it really easy to ensure that doesn't happen, but you never know. Um, and, and then the developer goes back to dev. They don't waste time having to deploy the same thing over and over and over again in a manual way. So that's what I mean by continuous integration. Some people call it CICD, um, continuous delivery. I, I don't care. Uh, I just call it CI because it's a shorter acronym. Um, but none of that works without an automation tool. So you could, uh, some people, if you roll your own, you might use Airflow for this or Workflow Manager. Some of the folks who's got like a Hadoop background, maybe you used uh, Uzi for this, and I hated Uzi. Um, XML-based uh, DAG generation for your, your workflows. Um, but today I'm gonna use GitHub Actions. GitHub Actions is kind of a newer feature. It's built into GitHub, which is my version control uh, kind of tool of choice. So I can just define specific actions that would run on a VM to build and test my code, and it'll take care of the rest. I have different triggers, um, and we can talk about which triggers we're gonna use for this, but this is really similar to like Circle CI or Travis CI or even Jenkins. Uh, they're all really similar. Um, they listen to your version control and on certain events will do actions for you. Uh, so if you're good at bash scripting, if you're good at Python, you can make almost anything happen as long as you have the right trigger. And then uh, that's gonna be our automation piece, but just automation and just some SQL in, in code doesn't get us all the way there because the automation would have to be really heavy to understand all of our different SQL files. Um, and the problem I have a lot writing SQL, do I put everything in one file and guarantee it runs in the right order uh, with the right checks and then it's just a massive incomprehensible file or do I split it up and have some kind of naming convention of like, 01-file name, 02-file name, some, something that will run them in the right order because you know, if you don't create a user before using the user, create a table before generating another table on top of that, you'll get failures. Um, I've used bash scripts in the past or, or even Python, um, but they're, they're partial, right? So if they fail, there's not always, unless you build it from scratch, the, the best logging for why it failed or what you can do about it. Um, and then as far as tests, that's an entire new suite stack that you have to integrate and build and it, it can be a lot. So DBT, um, which, who here has heard of DBT before? Yeah, okay, so it, it's a newer tool, uh, data build tool, it's from a company called Fishtown Analytics. They are um, like assassin data consultants for hire, they work for venture-backed startups, they sell by the sprint. Um, and they're very opinionated on how you should build your data warehouse for analytics purposes. Um, DBT is a framework that kind of fills the gap we've had. Right now, you guys might know about Fivetran or Stitch or Attunity. These are tools that will load your data into a single place. And it doesn't really care where that place is. They support different Snowflake, Redshift, Postgres, whatever you want to do. Um, and you don't have to worry about writing custom connectors to like Facebook or Google Ads or your, your RDBMS for CDC. Um, you could just use that, and that's become kind of commoditized. Uh, and then on the right, the connections to our BI tools, we, we have never had more choices than we have now. Uh, between Tableau, uh, Mode, Looker, um, Power BI, of course, is dominant here in OKC. Um, anything you want to use. But the missing piece is like, you, you don't hit raw data with Tableau. So what you might have is some amount, some amount of transformation happening in transit, ETL, right? Um, more these loaders, they really just focus on extract and load, and they leave the transformation to you. So um, you could do views, materialized views, you can do any sort of like, I have really, really hairy like tasks and streams based uh, processing flows that react to real time data coming in in Snowflake, but they're hard to build. And they're really hard to experiment with because I have to be pretty sure that what I'm building is useful before I put the work into hardening it. So in practice, I have a mix of hardened production ready flows that are not easy to change and immature flows that don't exactly have updated data and I might abandon because I move on to something else. Um, and none of it's in version control until I know it's worth putting in there. I clean it up, I get rid of like hash map specific stuff, I put it on a repo um, and then send it to people as they need it. So DBT uh, fills that gap. Um, it allows you to write basically select statements 
and configure through YAML files, really similar to how maybe Kubernetes is configured, the way you want these, uh, these select statements to be materialized in your database. So you create a select statement, select star from accounts where region equals Oklahoma. Just that statement, if you write it in your DBT script, will generate either a view, uh, a table, um, or, or something in between, depending on your backend, uh, that represents that data. So it's really easy to rationalize about, and anytime you want the data to be updated, you just run the DBT command line tool. It supports a, um, a number of different backends. Uh, I, of course, use Snowflake, this meetup, you know, it was a Snowflake meetup, but you can push it on anything you want. There are some like backend specific syntax things, but for the most part, you can write it rather modularly. So you can jump from one place to another. Um, these bottom databases, they're actually community supported. They're not official for Microsoft uh, SQL users, which I imagine there's a good number of those folks here. Um, so you can get started with that. Um, DBT is installed just as a Python package with pip, right? Um, and there's an init function that creates a whole new repo for you. Uh, they have pretty good documentation and they have a cloud service as well um, that makes it easier to develop if you want to and they also have CI built in, right? You don't have to do it the hard way like I did. Um, it, it's kind of hard to explain in the abstract. I keep telling people DBT is like riding a bike. Like once you use it, you get it, but it's really hard to like in the abstract explain how, how to think about this. So I was hoping we could dive in more concretely onto what DBT can actually do for your data teams uh, and how it might change the way you think about your SQL writers. Yeah, any questions so far? Yeah, so um, who, who makes DBT? DBT is not from Snowflake. They're, they're, it's an open source project from Fishtown Analytics, a consulting company who just works in this space. Um, and it, it tries to be somewhat agnostic of the underlying uh, data warehouse. So some of these here, like Redshift, uh, BigQuery, you don't see like Azure stuff so much. Um, I think that's probably because their target focus audience is venture-backed startups, and I don't think a ton of those are going to Azure as fast as they can. Um, but that's just me guessing, I don't know. Maybe it's not super possible to do. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Cool. All right. Yeah, Fishtown Analytics. Um, if you just type data build tool, they come right up as well. They've got a ton of great blogs that has really influenced my formal thinking of security design and uh, kind of modeling within different data warehouse environments. Uh, I do a lot less shooting from the hip than I did before. Um, so I can't recommend them highly enough. You should check them out. But if you're in an enterprise environment, like I said, their views and opinions are definitely flavored by their main clients. And I don't want to say they don't work with enterprise. You know, I don't know their business too much. But I definitely see like a bend towards more venture-backed behavior than what I might see at a Fortune 100. Yeah, so I'm sure there are some, uh, but for me, I don't know. I, there are some like GUI based stuff, so like Attunity. Uh, so the question was, um, what are some comparable tools to DBT? Uh, Attunity has a Compose product, which is kind of like a, a drag and drop, no SQL transforming tool. Matillion has something like that as well. Um, uh, Fivetran kind of has a SQL based transformation. Uh, suite that you can use, but none of it's quite exactly the same. DBT, um, kind of in a nutshell, treat your analysts and your SQL developers as if they were actual code developers and expected to use version control and expected to have code reviews and work agilely. So that's kind of the change that I don't see, um, even if you have another tool that can help you with your transformations, it still doesn't help with that same core problem of doing data analytics work as if it were software engineering. Yeah, good question. So today's stack, um, I have a lot of data coming in from Fivetran. Uh, it's the ETL tool I use probably the most um, because it is incredibly easy and it almost always works and I never have to tinker with it too long. Um, it is landing in kind of a raw load area for Fivetran. I have one for Stitch as well. I have one for really any of the um, ETL tools I use. And then DBT is going to pick up from those raw areas and do series of processes and tests 
and generate my top tables, my consumption zones, which feed my analytics tools, my reporting. Um, and this separation of concerns makes it really flexible to add new features. Um, uh, it makes it difficult for me to introduce errors that I'm not expecting. And I think from the BI side, you also get a lot more performance for being able to iterate fast. Because without this, what happens, or what I've even been guilty of, is that I make Tableau do a ton of custom SQL to do it the exact kind of right way for them because I built the, you know, the pipeline, the hardened pipeline, I built that for um, Power BI. And it handles this one thing fine, but Tableau doesn't. So what am I gonna do, add another component to the pipeline? Probably not, I'll just write a little custom SQL, and then you lose the centralized logic, right? of having all of your code and all of your warehouse in one repo so that if it goes down or something breaks, you can, from scratch, build the whole thing. And I don't think a lot of people could say that. Like, if you corrupt your database, you're in trouble right now. Or certainly that was the case before I started using dbt. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of our architecture today. And let's get hands on. So I'm gonna jump into my GitHub Actions. Um, and I could probably zoom this in. First off, we're going to jump into GitHub Actions, which is my automation kind of CI tool. Again, you could use anyone you want. Uh, talking during the break, uh, some people mentioned Azure DevOps and some of their pipeline utilities. This works really similar. Um, the big difference to me is that secrets are a lot easier. It's kind of why I didn't use Azure. <laughs> um, but, you know, we'll get into that. So the, the main kind of core unit in GitHub Actions is the workflow. Um, it is defined again by YAML. I think this is a pattern you'll see a lot um, where I define kind of a trigger that will start to build some amount of previous tasks referencing like other pre-built flows. I can modularly import those and use those. So like installing Python, I use a pre-built kind of path for that. Then I install uh, pip manually. So you can just pass in a series of bash commands. Um, when you configure your Workflow, you can have it reference environment variables, so I can dynamically switch what environment I am going to target, so test or prod. Um, and you can also determine whether you want to run on Windows, Mac, or just like Ubuntu, and I'm on Ubuntu for this. The three major kind of workflows I've created, um, let's go in order of like how they would actually be used. Test is the first one. So my test runs, uh, and I know it's a little tricky to see. I promise you won't have to actually read words here, but um, I can go back over the course of having this, and I can see all my failed tests. Uh, and this is really important. These are triggered by pull requests on the repo, so that before a pull request can be accepted, it has to pass all the tests. Uh, and that saves us a lot of having to roll back out of production. Uh, but it's not like every push triggers this, because maybe if you were simply doing internal unit testing here, you could do that, but when you're talking about Snowflake, every time it runs, I'm paying for at least a minute of warehouse time. So I wanna only run it when it will be impactful for me. Um, going back, uh, if a PR passes, then we accept the PR and it's merged into master. So I have uh, also um, a, a series of master production deployments. And I'll, I'll show you what this YAML looks like. not super large, but um, I, I, you give it a name, you tell it what the trigger is, here it's on a push to a master branch. Um, if you guys use releases uh, outside of master, you can have it pushed to some regex down here that is a release branch or you can use tags, they have a ton of different ones here. Um, and then I'm passing in different environment variables for my dbt profile. So uh, right here first we're going to a prod environment and then I have my secrets injected. So I don't have plain text passwords on the repo. Um, that's a thing at HashMap that has happened in the past. We've gotten hacked for it. I did a talk about that. Um, so if you're doing that, please stop and parameterize your, your secrets. Um, and then I, I define the job, right? So I'm telling it to run on Ubuntu, um, check out the branch. This is one of those pre-canned pre activities, right? Because almost all of these are gonna wanna check out the latest code. Um, then I install Python again. A lot of these actions will need to install Python or, or Node or um, Java, whatever your, your language is to be able to build it and test it. So these are pre-built. And then I install dbt. Um, thankfully, that's a really simple pip installation. So I upgrade pip uh, to make sure it's at the latest and greatest. Uh, then I install dbt. And then the last step here is just to run it. 
um, using my continuous integration profile, and then I test it. So this is your first kind of taste of what DBT is like to work with. It's a, it's a CLI, largely. Um, anyone here use Maven in the past for Java? Yeah? Really similar to that. I think about it all the time. Or if you guys package stuff uh, for Python, um, .NET, you're, you're probably using Visual Studio, right? Uh, so it's a little nicer, not always all CLI. Um, and then, you know, Go, Go has their own packaging ecosystem. But that's what this is for your SQL files, which has been missing for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, so where am I running my CI workloads? Um, GitHub is handling all of that for me. Yes, so GitHub, has a, uh, GitHub Actions has its own cloud space. Um, I'm in the free tier, which is, I think, I don't know that I would ever have any reason, even in an enterprise, with this to go outside of the free tier. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's a lot. There's like a limit of like eight concurrent builds, which I would, I would never do. I can't imagine a team getting that big. Um, and, and then if you wanted to, though, so say you're working with really high sensitivity secrets that they can't even exist in memory for a short amount of time on a machine you don't own, you can externally configure this to run on your own VMs, EC2, whatever you're doing. Um, and this can trigger that from there as well. Yeah, good question. Um, so um, that is the test um, and the prod deployments. These are life cycles you're probably familiar with. The last thing with DBT, um, because it's smart, and it stays, I don't wanna say, it, it stays focused on its core competency. It does not have a concept of scheduling out of the box. And if I have some amount of data coming in at a refresh rate on my load tables, which it does not claim to own. It does not own the loads. It knows where they are, what your source tables are, and you can configure some amount of like, you know, expect it to have this much data latency. Um, you, you can mark down that if you don't see a timestamp greater than like 24 hours from now, that's, a, that's an error, the data's stale. So you can tag it, but it is not gonna own the landing of that data. So uh, at the same time, it's not gonna own understanding automated scheduling off of data freshness. You would have to configure that based on how often you run these production runs. So if I have data coming in for a specific set of tables that I've tagged as being nightly, I can have a nightly production run, and then I can have my hourly stuff. I, it's rare that I would work with something faster than that, just because it's more expensive and I almost never need to know faster than an hour. Um, but that's what these are for, these scheduled runs. These are gonna pull from master at any time of the day. Whatever's in master, that's what it pulls, and it's gonna update everything with dbt. Um, I don't have the distinction between nightly and hourly right now, but you could do that. Um, you, back to that really high sensitivity environment, you can tag your stuff as PII or PHI or PCI as um, being really highly sensitive that the data cannot exist in even anyone else's VM uh, unhashed. So you can run your hashing with that on a local instance and then you can do everything else that is not PII from your, your cloud environment. So it's, it's quite flexible. Um, this, this file is almost exactly the same, except I don't run tests at the end. And instead of being scheduled based on a push to master, it's a cron job, which uh, I was very, very pleased to have written correctly without having to look up. This is gonna run every hour. Um, if you write cron jobs and you don't comment it, um, please help us other mortals. Please start commenting your cron jobs and your regex, please. Uh, let's start commenting both of those. Uh, yeah, so this is saying uh, every time that the hour is dividable by one, which is every hour, and the minute is zero, which is the top of every hour, go ahead and run. Um, but it's the same kind of stuff. We have a prod environment, I'm injecting my secrets, uh, and it is doing the installation, everything. We just don't run the test, um, which maybe you could, I don't know, I didn't, but maybe there's an argument to be made that you should be testing every single time. Okay. So back in just kind of my workflow, across all workflows, I can see what's happening, I can see when things fail. Ideally, you'll see a lot of PR failures um, early on where people are getting used to, oh, that thing broke and I didn't know it before and normally I would just merge it and deal with it later, maybe with like some creative Tableau side SQL. Um, but now it's no longer the case. So some of the most common tests that would fail here, well, first of all, things could just not compile, right? Um, like you use an invalid identifier or use syntax that doesn't work, right? I do that all the time. Um, or you could fail one of your 
pre-built out of the box tests and they provide like um, uh, no nulls, do a null check on a column. Any, if there's a null in there, especially on source data, that's really important to know if you're expecting zeros or like empty strings, but you get nulls, that can break things later. So it's really good to know immediately with your automated tests. And for people, I mean, things always change over time. That's something I think is lost sometimes in warehouse development that we just do the design, the data model, we deploy the SQL and that's, you know, we're done, it's done. Uh, but no, these things are living, breathing, things in source data changes. So you can confirm that that assumption you totally forgot about six months ago, when it does break, you know about it. Um, instead of it quietly just kind of going in because nulls are kind of like zeros and you won't know till way later. Um, so you'll see a lot of those. People have to fix them before the PR can be accepted. And you build kind of a, a, a developer-centric model for your analytics organizations. Um, that's really all there is to <laughs> workflows to actually like how do you build one? Um, you can either use their, like, go to actions on a repo that you have and click new workflow and it'll walk you through. Um, I just wrote it, the YAML directly, and referenced the, um, the documentation. So all you have to do at the top level of your um, repo is to add a dot GitHub directory and a workflows directory within that. And anything within here, uh, YAML, will be attempted to be used as a workflow. And if you formatted it wrong, which I formatted it wrong a ton of times, it's super hard. Um, when you're just getting started out, then uh, it'll throw an error to let you know. Kind of a tip here, um, set your triggers to be on push when you're first developing. That way they trigger immediately and you can test them. Because otherwise, like my, my prod, scheduled prod, when I first deployed it, I didn't know if it worked until it got to the top of the hour. Um, no, nah. so I'll find out if it works first. Write your stuff to be mostly idempotent, meaning you can run it two or three times and it doesn't break anything. Um, and you can test it that way. Any questions on GitHub actions? My man, yeah, what's up? Yeah, good question. So the question is, do the workflow definitions exist with your other SQL that code base, or does it exist in its own place that's referencing other repos that does have your SQL? Um, you can set it up either way, right? So within these YAMLs, when I'm referencing like pre-built like the Python installer, all I'm doing is referencing another repo that has a workflow that I can grab, right? So you can do it that way. I am storing it all in here because my workflows are really kind of specific to this environment that I have. Um, what I would like to do is have a base for my company. Like right now, there's my private space, ready picture. But on HashMap, I want a base for new DBT projects that can, includes the CI. And then you would parameterize it by storing the right secrets. And then everything else would just work. People just start writing SQL. They don't have to reconfigure this every single time. Um, and in that environment, yeah, maybe it's appropriate that I have a single CI repo that when I add a new repo online, they don't even have to know about CI. And then I just add in here to the list of things I'm gonna be checking. Um, add a reference to the other one. I don't know how triggers would work. Like, could I trigger on a PR from another repo? Maybe you'd have to check the docs. Um, but I like having it all kind of in, in one spot. Similar like how Travis or Circle would do. But um, yeah, if you have like a, like a more like backend library repo that is being used by your, your current build, um, you could definitely pull that in as well. You just have to write the bash. Any valid bash could work in here. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's go, let's look at a broken build. So the question was, um, what's the feedback process when a build does break? Let's go. So typically, because my dev process mimics so closely what will happen in PR, um, I don't submit a PR until I know it'll pass the test. Like I run the test locally um, and they do hit a, a pseudo integration environment that's just so similar, it's rare, but it would be really useful to know if a dev test passed, but a, um, a test environment suite of tests fails. That would be gold. So here's a, here's a PR that failed, and it shows the different kind of steps, right? So I'm in um, my prod iteration of this, which I think they have their own concept of, like you could just have your, your deployment and then using GitHub switch to different environments. I don't like that, I like to be a lot more explicit. 
So I've got one failure. So each different step that I defined in my YAML has its own like grouped by logging. So setting up the job went well. Let me get rid of that. Uh, installing Python was fine, installing dbt was totally cool, but the deployment broke. So I can look at the logs, and this is directly what dbt would give me. Um, I can see that there was a, a SQL error, compilation was bad. Uh, and it looks like I reached an end of file. This isn't the best. Sometimes they're, they're more descriptive than others, but I could run it locally. I go to the compiled SQL, which is gonna actually have your DDL in it, and I can see like, okay, there's a missing semicolon, or often, for me, there's too many semicolons. Uh, so you wanna grab those, or I'll, uh, I, I had this a lot recently. I was referencing a sequence in Snowflake without calling next val on the sequence. I don't know if you guys use sequences, but the sequence object is not, a, like a valid entry in a query, um, but the next val is, and that's actually what I wanted. Yeah, so good question. Um, if I'm running uh, on tests, right, so even if it doesn't fail, you can look at, so like a test PR I did this morning to actually set up some stuff for today. I can see the run actually deployed all the contents of the repo in my, um, PR underscore, that's a Unix epoch to identify different PRs, so you can have two running mostly at the same time, and they won't interfere with each other in my um, my rolling usage run, right? Like these all deploy just fine, and then I could run my tests. Um, and it looks like at this time I had no tests, so one of these future ones would have had the tests, but that's what it would look like. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's different things that you might want to do. So I, I had to turn off email alerting for failures here because I just I don't care that much. Um, but I don't know if any of you guys use Travis or something, but you can get a badge on your README. So the most current like production deployment, um, which is when I merge into master, I care about that. But I really care about my scheduled runs that they're not breaking. Um, so. I could just look right here. You can integrate this with Slack. You can integrate it with, um, oh, what is it? PagerDuty, if you like have a full-on SRE team, uh, keeping track of this kind of stuff. Yeah, good question. Uh, does, that, does that answer the question about feedback? Yeah. Cool, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, cool. Any other questions? Cool. So let's jump back to our space. Um, rolling some of Snowflake credit usage. So, uh, a really common metric that I've used for a while is um, for my company's usage of Snowflake, we, we keep a Sigma dashboard, which is, I mean, similar to Tableau or Power BI, it's just um, cloud native and superior in a lot of ways that I care about, and the places where it's rough I can deal with. And we have this top number that I look at a lot, which is our credits used in the last 30 days. It's just a sum over the last 30 days of credit usage. Uh, if you use Snowflake, you know that usually, and for everyone I work with, your um, compute is where what drives all your costs. Storage is just incredibly cheap. It, it's, not, it, it's not worthy in my environment of a dedicated panel in my dashboard. Uh, but credits absolutely are. And everything else here is helping me identify if credits are high, why they're high, and who to yell at. Um, but what this doesn't show me is, over time, has my usage gone down? I implemented this, um, this dashboard uh, in October because we were burning through credits at a crazy pace to the point where I like, couldn't do demos because we'd run out of budget. Um, and in my environment, you know, I'm an admin, um, my users are maybe different from the normal user set because they all also kind of are admins because I'm training consultants to do crazy stuff with Snowflake and be the expert at a new place. Um, but also, you know, they're new. So I have a high volume of fresh Snowflake users who have full admin control. Uh, so I'm constantly having to monitor because there's not really uh, many safety guards. I try to add a few in there without, you know, slowing people down. But yeah, that's kind of a bit about my environment. So monitoring is hugely important, and at the end of the week, Sigma's awesome about this, it sends a picture, an image of this, uh, which is good because a lot of our people, especially executive people, they, I don't really trust them to log into this and find the right space, right? They just wanna see a picture and then move on. It sends a picture to our Slack channel on Snowflake. Friday at three o'clock, um, it's kinda rings in the weekend for me when I see that coming in, like, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm done. 
Uh, um, and what I noticed was initially we were at like 600 credits. We were really high. And every week it got down a little lower. We'd get down to 500, 400. We had a huge drop just because there was stuff I turned off. Um, and then you see it lower and lower and lower. Then I think last week or the week before we were at like 45 credits. Um, we're super high right now for some stuff I did, kind of this, right? to prep, um, but our run rate is a lot lower than that 600. And what I want to prove, maybe to a boss or whomever, that my time spent monitoring actually had an impact. So what I did was in, in, in my text editor, make this larger, I created um, a DBT project. So uh, anyone familiar with Snowflake knows that a lot of this usage is just exposed back to your environment um, through these shared tables, these account usage tables. Um, and that's actually what Snowflake's using to bill you. Um, not all of those are incredibly useful for this, but the metered warehouse usage is really useful because it shows me the credits by warehouse that uh, I've accumulated or I've been charged. Uh, the problem with this, table though is that it's exposed to a really secure share and if you've ever tried to query it it takes a long time the latency can be like 30 40 seconds or more um, they have a disclaimer on their website that it can take up to 45 minutes to wait for that data to show up even for kind of small data so rather than hit live bi to that i uh, implemented a flow in fivetran um, anyone here use fivetran i know some of these guys do okay so let me show you uh, Fivetran is a fantastic ETL tool. Um, it's got a huge catalog and growing catalog of connectors to different data sources I care about, um, including some like custom Lambda stuff I use to monitor our AWS footprint. Um, but if I wanted to add something, I mean, lots of analytics stuff. You guys are doing any kind of marketing, Apache Kafka. Um, oh, they've got new AWS ones in here that I want to check out, Config and CloudTrail, which is really what my Lambdas were doing. So um, all, always awesome to come in here and check this out. So you set that up, and it just lands data magically in your Snowflake environment. So you can go back to the world where, man, if I had this data and it was live, I could do cool stuff, but it would take forever to do it, and I can't really show how cool it would be to a boss because I don't have it, and you're just stuck in that. It's just like, well, no, set it up, and if it's cool, like, okay, we should keep paying for this. This is awesome. Uh, they have this other concept, though, called a transformation. And this is some arbitrary SQL that you can schedule here to run. Um, Snowflake has tasks, uh, but they have a limitation that if you want to do anything kind of adventurous, you're probably going to be running a stored procedure um, written in JavaScript, which is kind of a turnoff to me. Um, they, they've got other things coming, right? But um, you can work around the JavaScript thing. But even if you do something that would not normally trigger a warehouse to run in that stored procedure, like doing some DDL, um, your warehouse is going to be running every time the task runs for a minimum of 60 seconds. And that, was not, that wasn't acceptable to me for some of this because some of this uh, materialization I have checks to see if there's any work to do without turning a warehouse on. So often it'll run and I don't have anything to do. But I can see a history of runs here. I can edit the details, uh, set up the schedule. I have it running once a day, but it would be nominal. It would be so trivial for me to run that every two hours, right? Um, it's on a time schedule, but I could have it triggered on new data arriving from my other sources. And it's just SQL. I have this in a GitHub repo uh, as well, but I'm grabbing the hard to read high latency tables and persisting them in a normal physical table that I can point all of my other transformations to, and my BI is way faster. Um, you give up like up to the second um, data latency, but I don't need that anyway. You know, I'm looking at the past 30 days. What do I care if it's 24 hours delayed? Um, so that, that lands data here in Snowflake. In Fivetran. And I can see that in my hash map Snowflake usage. And I get some query history. Um, which is really, really useful for when I'm monitoring who is using the account admin role, which no one should be using, uh, because that makes my job super hard to like try to modify things that the account admin made. But people who are new to Snowflake want to use account admin because it always works no matter what, until later and it breaks. Yeah, so um, I have a little alert there that if someone other than me is using account admin, like I have a little pop-up, right? Uh, 
Um, tasks, those can be hard to track down by individual tasks. They're just line item build as a single task in your credits. That doesn't tell me which of my 70 tasks are driving costs. Um, so I have that here as well, same with snow pipes. But then the warehouse metering history, this is really what I wanna target and it's gonna be uh, really fast to hit. So in DBT, I have, you know, let's maybe go through the, the structure here. Um, we have our .github, this is where those workflows are. My CI profiles, this is just YAML that is parameterizing for CI. My credentials and like target information for Snowflake in different environments. Um, I have a profiles in my .dbt directory at my home directory, uh, but those have like secrets in them, so I'm not gonna show those. But those are like for me, the person, which you wanna attribute to, but for the actual dev uh, or the automation entities, they'd use this. DBT modules, they're just modules other people have written that you can reuse for really common tasks. Fishtown has a ton of them. Um, for example, if you use Snowplow Analytics, uh, they have pre-built parsing and cleaning all the way up to your top tables as modules you can just import into your library and reuse. Um, that traditionally has been a really hard thing to do in SQL. Um, macros, these are custom functions I write, and I have one for a custom schema specifically, so I, uh, I check to see if I'm in prod, and if I am, I just use my custom schema name. I don't use any defaults, and if I'm not in prod, I use a default schema, which will append my username to any schema I create. That way, Randy underscore pitcher staging, Randy underscore pitcher reporting, doesn't interfere with like Andy's space. So we can all develop and not have to change code, and it just knows, right? That's super valuable. Um, Snowflake setup, there's some amount of stuff that just for creating things out of nothing, unless you wanna make DBT top level admin, which I would not do, um, I'm gonna have some admin stuff to run, creating my transformer roles, creating my warehouses and my databases, and then granting those permissions to my CI users and granting them to my individual developers. Um, role, role design is its own whole other talk or two, so we'll skip over that. And then uh, I have my tests and my models. Models is where you're mostly gonna live. So you can put any kind of folders you want down here, it'll recursively check when you run dbt uh, down to your SQL files, and it'll take the name of the SQL file and that's the name of your object. You can override that, but that's default. And I have really kind of two main spaces. I have staging, where I'm gonna take my raw data and do some initial cleaning on it and some transformations. Uh, then I have reporting, and then this entire schema, the reporting schema, is readable by my Sigma service account. So anytime something new shows up here, automatically my, my analysts can get a hold of it. Uh, and they don't accidentally hit like staging data uh, and then get surprised when it's gone because it, it's not meant to be you know, compliant over the long term to different needs. And in Snowflake, uh, I have this YAML. Um, and this is defining my sources into Fivetran. So it points to these two different uh, Fivetran sources, my query history, my, my database, my uh, warehouse metering history. And uh, I assign this loaded at field that I have um, Every time I run that transformation, it uses the current timestamp to mark an ingestion time. And I've said that if this ever takes more than 24 hours to run, that you would warn me that my source data is not fresh. Um, and you can see that expanding to lots of different use cases where you're not writing your own custom SQL, but you're using um, some other source of data, or you have an SLA with a service provider, and you wanna be sure that your data is landing at the freshness you've agreed to, and anytime it's not, you are persisting that somewhere that you've been outside of your SLA. Maybe you can get a discount, or, I don't know, leave them and get someone better. Uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so this is this is stateless, right? So it's gonna say at whatever time I run, um, and the question was, because DBT doesn't have this concept of scheduling built in, how, how does this time stuff actually work, right? Whenever you run it, it's going to do a check on these sources, because this is a source constraint I've added. You don't have to have this, you can have more, right? You can, I could have actually within these tables here, column constraints to make sure that a certain column exists, or that it's not null, or like an ID column is actually unique doesn't repeat, those, those kind of things. Um, so it'll check through those constraints, and depending on your like error level, right now I have it at warn, but I can have a full error. 
and a full error level for like core critical data quality concerns regarding the freshness or actual value integrity um, will stop the build and I'll get a notification. Um, and that's, that can be something really important, especially if you split your builds out over time. Like right now I'm working on one single project. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want an error in one project to stop your whole warehouse. Um, so you can split it based on the granularity that's appropriate for you. But for me, yeah, if, if one of these two things are outside of my expected um, compliance, I don't want it running. I want to get a notification. Good question. Um, yeah, so this is a, a little bit about how I define how I want this snowflake space to be understood. Um, the schema I want it to end up in uh, is actually not here. It's in another YAML. You, you get used to the, the YAML overload. And then I, I kind of name my models. You don't have to do this for every model, but for models that can be confusing, like the sum of usage, um, I have a description, right? So this is... Um, for our specific HashMap AWS flavored Snowflake, we have a much less used Snowflake uh, that's based on GCP that we use for like testing for certain clients that do use that, but none of our production stuff goes there. It has low usage. And it would be confusing for someone to come in here and see like, okay, HashMap Snowflake daily usage if they only knew about that GCP one to see it was so high. So I'm able to add some descriptions and I can add tests here to my different columns. So my calculated on, this is the date um, that the, the data was grabbed on for the day, so we group by the day and we do a sum on those. And it should never be null, and it should be unique. I shouldn't have, if I'm grouping by day and getting daily usage, um, I should never have two days in the same table, two of the same days. These are really easy to just kind of add here. So uh, starting with my pass through, I just do a select star from the source. And you reference sources using Jinja. Uh, so Jinja, it's kind of like a Python templating Library, it allows you to inject things dynamically into your SQL or do things like for loops or uh, conditional statements. A uh, really popular conditional statement is if I'm in a dev run um, to sample production data. So I'll do a, a if environment is not prod, then, and I'll inject a little line that says to um, sample the data or limit a thousand, something like that. And that can make tests run way faster. But this is it. Like you just, I'm using a CTE right here. Uh, common table expression. Any valid select statement on Snowflake will run here. Um, everything inside these curly brackets will be replaced with the actual fully qualified database schema relation name that's generated by dbt. And it now knows that this stage, the, the usage, relies on this source. And so it has a DAG of dependencies for lineage. Uh, but this one's not all that interesting. We're just selecting star, leaving it as it is. Um, so this would be raw individual level um, credit billing metering. Uh, multiple of those can happen in a day across multiple warehouses. So to get my daily usage, which could be used for lots of other computation, um, it is rather complex. So I'm extracting this complexity from future things, not going into it super high, but the, the real kind of useful part is down here. I, I use a sum and a date trunk to get the credits used for that day and the, the date it was calculated on grouping by the calculated on date, um, and then ordering descending uh, on this. So I can see it in order. That may not be necessary, but I like it. Uh, and then at the very end, I'm just selecting star from this. This is a convention you don't have to follow. If you just want to write like nested SQL, if you're more comfortable with that, you can do that. I think CTEs are more readable. Um, and at any point, like if some of these combined usages, which are going to account for like missing days, if those need to be broken off into their own staging table, I just cut them out and then persist them. Like if they're gonna be used in multiple other spaces or if they need to be materialized differently, like right now this is materialized as a view by default, but I can tell DBT to make this be its own table because the compute's really expensive and I just want you to incrementally um, add new data. I can do that here and then in the future use views and other spaces that leverage this. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, so with this, if I ran it, let me see. Oh, okay. I did run it and it asked for credentials with SSO and I didn't give it to him, so it's been hanging. So um, this is also kind of small, I know that. So dbt has a number of different life cycles. What I want to do here is just dbt run. I could give it a, a specific model I want to run, so my top table being like my rolling sum. So I have that daily usage and then in my reports, I have the rolling sum of usage. 
which is um, actually pretty simple. I do a, a window function that goes over the last 29 records, and including the current one as 30, uh, with a sum of the credits used. And I'm not partitioning by anything. I'm, I'm just doing a sliding window across the whole, the whole table um, to get my daily usage over the last 30 days, which is this super long column name, uh, and the date it was calculated on. Um, something really useful for my metadata is to identify calculated on is going backwards 30 days, because it could just as easy be that I use the start of the 30 day window to report it, uh, but I like the end. So uh, again, the metadata comes in really handy here. So to run it, I do that. I can specify a target, which would either be my uh, dev test prod. Um, I default to dev, and that's what I want here. So I'll do that. Um, it's gonna request my credentials. You can either embed your username and password, which if you guys have usernames and password, I would do that, because this is a pain. Um, otherwise, you can use SSO. SSO with Snowflake, um, I think it's still like getting better because I have to stay here and click on multiple auth windows before it'll actually fully run. And if you uh, try to multi-thread this, because DBT will run like in parallel, uh, I went to eight multi-threading and it popped open like 10 different auth windows for me. It's just such a huge pain. So we have success. It ran everything, it deployed it. Um, I could see there were no errors in the deployment, but I didn't actually run any tests. Um, and if I want to see what that data looks like, uh, I come up in my dev environment. Cloud cost monitoring dev, and then you can see it's my username underscore reporting and underscore staging. And in reporting, I have my uh, rolling sum of usage, which is a transient table. So. I know that it's not the kind of data I want to have long time travel history on, but I still want it persisted because BI is gonna hit it. And I do hit it with BI. I hit it um, with this right here. Let's see if I can make this bigger. So um, really hard to read, but what we have here is going back to the beginning of the month that I implemented my uh, reporting, I can see that Snowflake rolling 30 day sum of usage, um, it, it spiked and that's because it was kind of periodic. We would see it spike up very, very high for different demos or anything. Uh, and then that line there, which is hard to read, that's the date I, I deployed to production our first reporting of the dashboard. And then over time, and that's really all I did. I cleaned up some simple stuff, but really it was just reporting the usage to everyone in our Snowflake Slack channel. Um, they kind of self-corrected and it dropped. And then you can see when I started preparing for this, uh, we spiked up quite a bit initially, actually. I, um, I turned some tasks on to see if I can automate some things, and the minimum 60 second billing killed me on here, and that's how I knew to um, use Fivetran. <laughs> and you can see it, it plateaued right when I started using Fivetran. Yeah, so this would be a good kind of first step. But what about tests, right? So. The next kind of step is this Git branch I have, which is a, a quality fix. So one thing that is not super apparent in this graph, it doesn't come up in the SQL that I write, what do we got here, um, is that this is wrong. If you guys saw the partition function, I'm going back the last 29 rows for a given day. Something really weird, not that weird, but something about the source table for the metering history is if you don't have usage, you don't have an entry for that day. So for days that I don't have usage, they get skipped. So rather than this being a true 30 rolling day average, it's 30 day rolling, sorry, sorry, 30 day rolling sum of the last 30 days where usage was reported. It's slightly different. And uh, I don't know if your users are like mine, but if you give two slightly different numbers, there's no trust. Um, they think everything you do is crap and they're going back to Excel. So um, how, do, how do we keep this from happening? So I talked to some people, um, what I thought would be good, and maybe you guys, if you have opinions on this, like what could we do? I know that I have the usage table comes in, and I can grab the minimum and the maximum days across that range. I could also calculate how many days are in between that. So I wrote a test. Um, you can check my logic here, and tests go in your test area. We have our like null tests and stuff, those are built in, but I wrote a custom one. And this one I set to warn because I can't actually get it to pass, and um, I didn't want to, well, I can't cancel today, right? So um, it's set to warn, and what I really do is I take the count of my, um, my daily usage, 
I take the first day and the last day, and then the difference as the number of days. That's the first CTE, really trying to get that number of days. And then my validation query here is that I'm gonna grab everything from this table, which is really just one row, right? It's a summary of my underlying table. Um, grab everything there where the number of rows is not equal to the number of days. That seems, that seems rational to me, right? If I'm doing a rolling uh, average on a table that I expect to have one entry per day, no matter what, even if it's zero, um, then a good way to check it is do those numbers equal? And right now they don't equal. I don't have anything in there where it's zero. Um, so this test fails. And the way a test works is if it returns any data, any rows, it's a failure. So you can write any arbitrary SQL you want in here uh, and any references you make. Uh, DBT knows that that's a test required for that specific model. Um, it'll, it'll run through right here. And it can be different, like warn that doesn't break my builds, but maybe it should. Uh, certainly it should in the future right, after I've got this fixed, because I know it's not super intuitive. And it's the kind of bug or error that I don't think, with a non-DBT approach, you would necessarily catch, unless you knew what you were looking for, right? Um, you wouldn't catch it until your users noticed it. And it would be really kind of hard to figure out what happened unless you kind of got lucky, or if you've seen this before. I'm sure a lot of people here doing rolling averages, this, like, is duh to them, but it was kind of new to me. So that's uh, the testing. Um, and again, you can put these in arbitrary depth folders that you want, uh, DBT will look for it. The uh, folders that, like, how does DBT know to look in models or into tests? The whole project has a YAML, and I'm putting sources in models. Uh, analysis paths, those are really cool. You can use the same templating language, and DBT will parse that template and the references you're using to create valid SQL, but it doesn't actually run them. So you can do, really common uh, initial queries stored here, and then you, after it compiles for whatever changes happen underneath the hood, uh, you can give that SQL to your analyst as like a base for their analysis. Um, or like DDL kind of stuff for granting permissions to users, all that kind of stuff works there. Data paths, um, if you want to actually upload like a CSV and persist it, like if you have a lookup table, that this is one I see a lot uh, in different industries, specifically like marketing and stuff. Um, they have different regions in the region codes, like Northeast or N East or Northern California or NCAL. Like they mean the same thing, but it's just not super look upable. Like right? there's not like a SQL function that'll convert the state to the proper region. So you can just have a CSV, which they probably are using already. You pop it in your version control because it's a small enough table. It's really just for looked up and conversions. Um, and then as changes happen there, you can update it and then that will persist as an actual lookup table in your warehouse. And you can make sure tests pass on it. You can make sure that you have no non-matching mappings in your, you know, your, your marketing table from code to actual qualified region. You can even give it a list of region names that will be acceptable as a test. So it should contain these six places. If it doesn't, that's a failure. So data quality becomes a software engineering problem rather than a, you know, an end user trust problem. So to run these tests, um, you, you just run dbt test. And again, this is gonna hit my dev, but I can run tests against prod here. Um, I've got super user access, so I, I can actually do whatever I want. Uh, I typically recommend that you don't allow your devs to be able to influence the CI or the prod environment with their default developer roles. If they have root, let them log into Snowflake, upgrade on purpose to root, and they, that way they don't accidentally overwrite stuff, because I've accidentally overwritten stuff. It wasn't on purpose. But if I'd had a step or two in between to keep me from doing that on accident, um, it would have kept me from dropping tons of super valuable data at a huge company right out of college, right? That's not a hash map, I don't do that anymore. But. <laughs> Good lesson to learn. So uh, we had these things pop up, right? These um, auth windows. And I got a warning. So you, you asked what, what it would look like if a uh, test failed. This is what it looks like. Bright yellow letters that um, haunt me because I tried to fix it and I could not get the number of rows to equal the number of days. I'm like off by like 100. Uh, so the fix I tried to do, that's that large CTE I have here. So 
I start with a pre-hook. These are really cool, pre-hooks and post-hooks. Um, DBT will run a pre-hook before you actually execute all this, and it'll run a post-hook after you do. Post-hooks are really useful for granting permissions to things that don't exist until you run it, right? So post-hook will grant permission. Pre-hook, I need a sequence, right? And I have to create the sequence if it's not there, and if it is there, I wanna replace it so it starts from zero. Um, and that needs to exist before I actually run my SQL. So I do a pre-hook here, um, starting at zero and incrementing by one. The idea is I want to do a date add for every day between the start date and the end date of my usage and just have the usage be zero. That way, if I do have a missing day, the sum will be zero, it'll have an entry here. And if I don't have a missing day, it won't affect the actual sum. Um, so I have the usage here, then I have the reported usage date range, just kind of useful for not having to go back super far in history. But turns out that you can't parameterize your um, row count for a generator. So I just said, go back a thousand days from today. Take, take the current timestamp, grab the next value from here, and use date add, which with a minus is date diff. Um, at the day level, subtract this number, which is gonna start at zero, so it'll start with today, and then yesterday, and then back, back, back a thousand days, like three years. And that'll cover this. But something really interesting here is in three years, or in like probably a year and a half, um, this will break, because it won't go back far enough to get all of the data. Maybe I don't care, right? Am I really looking at data that old? But my test won't pass anymore in three years, and that's kind of a really valuable piece, right? Is that I can encode my expectations in a test, and then kind of use a little technical debt here, because my presentation was coming up, and I could just slap a thousand in here rather than try to figure out how to parameterize it. Um, and then I filter out this, so I should have the current, or I should have a start time and then credit to use, which is the same format as the actual raw usage. But this is zero. Start time being just midnight of each day between the start of my usage and the end, or right now it's between today and a thousand days ago. And then filter out where it is within the range. Um, so there'll be a ton of older days, right, from before we even had Snowflake that won't fit this. Combined usage, I just union them, right? I grab the credit usage from my normal usage and then the fillers from here. And then I actually compute daily usage from this combined usage, which is gonna run my actual function, right? Um, and I can't get it to work. So uh, that's fine. Uh, let's assume that that's okay for now. Uh, this is still powering our, our dashboard just fine. So what I can do is make a pull request. So right now my current um, branch is the Snowflake daily usage quality fix because I, I knew there was a problem there. It's not actually gonna fix it. So get status. I think I probably have a ton of stuff. Um, I have aliases for like really common Git stuff I use. So Gcam is Git commit dash a dash m, yeah. which really screws me up getting on someone else's laptop because <laughs> I don't remember how to do it. Okay, so that's pushed um, and ready for PR. So in GitHub, I can go to my pull request. New pull request from here, from, from my other branch into master. So that, normally, you know, you have some format for what you actually put in here. I'm usually pretty strict about that. I can create the pull request. So git, through the magic of my actions, is gonna start with checking if the branch is compatible with master. Um, did I merge master first? I'm the only one working on it, so I didn't have to. And then it's gonna start looking at any running um, actions. And if these fail, um, I can't, I can't merge it. I mean, I can, I'm the admin. Um, but it, I would have to use special admin privilege privileges to do so. And I can check out the status of this as it's running to make sure it passes. Um, typically, no, this would not pass. Like, I think I made a fix. My tests show that it doesn't actually fix it, but I made it be a warn instead of an error, so it will pass here. And I can see it installing dbt. It'll move into deploy. Some of these branches, if you're like way better at actions than I am, you can actually run in parallel. Um, I don't. And, and I think all of this stuff is like dependent anyway. You couldn't, you couldn't parallelize. Uh, any of this. Yeah, but um, that's gonna run. And when it's when it's ready, this will turn green. 
uh, and I can accept it. It'll go into my master branch, and that'll kick off a rebuild into prod, which if it fixed it, all I would have to do is refresh this page because the table's fixed, and I could see if it had a big impact. Um, so that's, that's that. Any questions so far about kind of that whole ecosystem? I know it's a ton to like take in at once. Um, there's not a substitute for like installing dbt with pip and just doing dbt init to get a folder of your own and like do a hello world, man. Or grab this repo. You can run it all yourself. It'll work in your environment the same way. You just have to get rid of my stuff, right? Add your own secrets. Okay, so it, it passed. It showed that um, the test passed, there were no problem. If I went into my repo here, or uh, in my, my test environment, um, I can see that my latest one is down here. This is the one that just ran at 12.54. Uh, and I could do future QA from here. Um, we don't do that at all. Um, you may notice these accumulate, so like I'll need a nightly batch to delete this whole schema or this whole database, like recreate it. Um, but for now, it's nice to see over time, do the tests actually fix anything? <clears throat> and I can merge the pull request. Confirm, that's gonna go straight into master. And from here, I pull it and I'm ready for, ready for the next thing. Um, what I was going to do is deploy like a rolling average function. Um, and this, this is going to build on its own. It'll show up in my prod environment. And then I can use Sigma to consume that to get, thanks guys. To, um, to get the average, right, I would just take, in my reporting, I want to create a new file. And I'll take the exact same SQL here, right? Um, but in here, instead of having sum be the, the thing I want, I'll use average which I think is valid syntax for Snowflake. Um, and it'll do the, the exact same thing. Rolling average, make sure I don't leave some in. Yeah, save that and then I can run this in my dev environment. What's that? Oh yeah, it keeps pulling up for that. Oh really, did you put passwords in? Yeah. The only thing that has kept me from using the passwords is like, I'm kind of strict in our environment that people don't even have passwords to use. You have to use SSO and I would not exactly be following my own rules. So I might, I might have to get to the point, right, where that doesn't fly anymore. But anyway, it passed. Um, it all deployed, and then in my dev space, in my reporting, if I refresh this, I have my rolling average. And then I can PR that, make sure it tests. I probably should write some tests for this, right? Probably the same ones. Um, push it, accept in PR if the test pass, and then that'll just show up, and then my Sigma user when they want to create a new dashboard, they can just add a new data source. It's just waiting for them. Um, that's, that's really everything. Um, I have a little bonus. That's cool. I know you guys were over time here, but I, I'll show you something that really, for me, makes CBT one of the coolest things to use. So they have this concept of docs, right? So I'm going to generate some docs here uh, against my prod environment. And then I'm going to serve the docs. And this is going to pop off quite a few, quite a few auth pages. Um, but what this does is it takes the metadata I've told it about in these YAML files. It uh, takes the resulting kind of DAG that comes from having a source that's being used by multiple staging tables that are combined or split up for multiple you know, 
third layer tables all the way up to my analytics tables. And it generates a, a website, local website, static website, um, maybe similar to Java Docs, if you guys have ever used that, um, that allows me to explore my environment visually. And it has all those descriptions and comments that I created, they're right here. So it's like a data dictionary out of the box. Um, for people who are looking at this like rolling 30 day sum and wondering like what specific hash map instance do you mean? Because I happen to know there's two. And um, what specific kind of calculation are you using? Without looking at the SQL, you can come in here. So my coolest thing to see is this kind of DAG where I have my sum up here, my usage down here. We can see they both feed off of the same daily usage um, that is just off of my stage here, which isn't necessary in this environment, but eventually I would like pull only the columns I need, recast them to the right types, um, and fix anything wrong with the source. I have this usage history query here. I'm not actually looking for admin access right now, but I am in another environment. Um, and then when I go into my sum, I can view the documentation. It's quite small, but I can see the description of the table. I can see the different um, columns I have and what specific tests I'm running against them. So it must be not null and unique. Uh, and I can really explore my environment and then I can see what the compiled SQL would look like if someone wanted to uh, test this for themselves. Um, and you, you can look all the way through staging, I can see sources, you can see it as a database view, like this is what Snowflake actually has, or you can do it based on my project. And this is the coolest thing, so the next step for CI would be to generate these docs and serve them from some well-known place, right? So generate the docs, put the static files in an S3 bucket that is a hosted website. And every time they get updated, the website has, has the newest lineage. You might even be able to do that with SharePoint for the Azure folks. So that's it, guys. That's, um, that's all of it. We skipped a couple here. We got through bonus, uh, generated the docs. Yeah, questions. So um, any questions? Anything uh, on your mind? Cool. All right, well, thanks, guys. I know, <laughs> I know we went over. Um, if you have questions afterwards, let me know. But um, yeah, thanks for coming.